no when they when they ask me like you know who should i see or you know should i go to somebody with your group or you know mm-hmm. like who's going to help me with such and such problem i say well you know I'm not only a doctor here but i've tasted the cooking myself so yeah yeah you know, yeah so well that's kind of why we wanted to interview you um so let let's kind of just jump right into it because that is kind of a nice segue into why we wanted to speak with you so one of the really cool things and Actually, I think when you first reach out, you had reached out to work with John, but at the time he wasn't taking it on any clients. And so John was like, you know, you could speak with Rory, my wife. Um, she's taking on clients right now. And I was like, yeah, he's an orthopedic surgeon. This is going to be so much fun. Um, so the cool thing about working with you is that you're not only someone who's gone through not just one, but two surgeries in the same area but orthopedic surgeries, but you're also yourself an orthopedic surgeon. So we wanted to speak with you to kind of get this hybrid viewpoint of the integration of barbell training into post-op orthopedic rehab for um, not just the high level athlete, but also the, the, you know, kind of... Oh, <laughs> the kind of Sorry generalized... That. No, that's okay. Um, generalized, general strength athlete or strength trainee. Um, so why don't you go ahead and just introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your professional career as an orthopedic surgeon, what kind of people you treat, and anything exciting about your career that, that we don't know about, which we don't know about any like projects that you work on and stuff like that. So go ahead. Sorry about all these mishaps here. I'm new to podcasting. No, so. it's okay. It's okay. <laughs> we'll add to the authenticity of the whole thing. I'm, I'm, I'm <laughs> plugging in. I apologize, but can you hear me okay, first of all? Yes. Yes. Good. I think we're all hooked up. No, it's an absolute pleasure to be on. And yeah, you're right. The um, I re- originally reached out to your husband um, through Grant Brogy. Grant, mm-hmm. shout out yep. to Grant at the Strength Co. I, I got mm-hmm. to be friends with Grant online somewhere probably around the time I was kind of embarking on this whole journey, like 2018, 19, give or take, somewhere in there. And, and um so yeah, I guess I'll just start with who I am first, Dr. Matthew DePaulo, uh, call me Matthew. Um, I am now in Buffalo, New York. I've been here for six and a half years, almost going on seven years, but I'm an orthopedic surgeon. I do specialize in shoulder and elbow surgery predominantly. I do, um, you name it, um, the full gamut from fractures to instability surgery to rotator cuff repair. Uh, elbow surgery, uh, joint replacements in the shoulder and elbow. I also do some smaller amount of hand. I have other partners who do a lot more hand than I do, but I do a lot of basic hand, like carpal tunnels and trigger fingers and things like that. But I really, I love it. Um, it's a it's a wonderful specialty. Um, you really get to take people from, you know, having a real problem um, from start to finish and and seeing them through and. In, in, in all different age groups. I mean, I deal with people probably from teenage years all the way up into their 90s. Um, I don't I don't deal with some of the smaller kids because we have other partners who do that. It's its own specialty pediatrics. But um, shoulders I love because, and it was, it was kind of an area that I happened upon when I was in um, residency. Um, I originally had, had um, I had like spine also, and that's still an area. I know I have a twin brother who does spine, so that kind of <laughs> works out well but um that's a I could get him on maybe for a different discussion oh that would be so fun yeah. I know but um no I like that I, I guess both had parallels both there's a certain amount of complexity to them um and I discovered the shoulder when I was in residency um I, I felt like there were a lot of things I could kind of sink my teeth into there was a lot to learn there was a lot that was changing and it still is changing there's um one of the things that we've seen is a big evolution in arthroscopic techniques, development of arthroscopic techniques. Um, we've also seen a, a, a big revolution in, in what we call the reverse shoulder replacement, which has opened up um, a lot of treatments to um, for problems that maybe weren't solvable in the past. So, mm-hmm. so those are things that are kind of active areas of interest in research and and. Um, but I just, I find it a great field. It's, you know, probably for a lot of the same reasons you guys do, where you're helping people become functional again. And, and that was always, you know, when people were are deciding what to do for medicine, um, 
we often kind of fall into stereotypes, you know, like I remember that I interviewed with a plastic surgeon when I was in medical school or getting into medical school, I should say, applying for medical school. And he said, oh, you'll be perfect for orthopedics because I was an athlete, played played football in college and multiple sports in high school and before. And um, I honestly wasn't leaning towards orthopedics then. I just knew I wanted to do some form of surgery. There was just this the tactical, the the technical aspect, the um, manual aspect, the, um, uh, the there's there's an element of sort of physical and intellectual at the same time that I knew was right for me. Um, so I kept it in the back of my head, but but I did find myself gravitating towards fields that were function oriented. In other words, there's some fields where it's life and death. You know, we're saving lives, and for whatever reason, emotionally, I wasn't drawn to that. Mm-hmm. But emotionally, I was drawn more towards helping people function well. It's sort of, can you live a better life? You know, it's one thing to live a longer life, but can you live a life of better function and just, you know, can you function well? So um, orthopedics uh, was, that was an easy sell in, from that regard. And and that's been, I guess, my perspective from ever since. And I, I really, I feel like it's, it's actually, um, I feel that even more so now than when I was interviewing. Again, I remember interviewing then into residency and and I felt that same pull of helping people improve function. And I feel like as I get moved farther along in my career, you learn more, you become more uh, technically sound. Um, I I, I keep going back to that fundamental and, and feel prouder or more confident that I can actually help function or know when you can't also it's probably important to note when you when you maybe can't do the um what you can and can't do um so yeah that got me into orthopedics in fact <laughs> i think back on these things because you know now you give it a little time to reflect uh, when people ask you uh, you know I, I interview medical students and i interview residents um in in our program because we have we're part of a teaching program at the university of buffalo um so we have sort of a, a mixed model where we have our own practice um that runs just like any private practice but then also we're part of the broader teaching institution at university of buffalo we have a residency where we teach five orthopedic residents every year and i'm part of that so i do a lot of teaching so i reflect on these things relatively often you know because i'm helping guide some of these um, guys and girls who are kind of moving into their career too and trying to decide and i remember one of the um I had a couple interviewee or interviewers, I should say, that when I was applying to residency, um, a few said, oh, I really liked your personal statement. And it brings me back because I remember I led off with saying I spent most of my original, most of my early life trying to avoid the orthopedic surgeon. <laughs> and that was my <laughs> lead in to my essay. And it sort of caught their attention. And it was the truth because going to the orthopedic surgeon when you were, you know, playing sports meant you weren't going to play that you were mm-hmm. out you were on the sideline and I consider myself pretty lucky that in my career so I like I said I played a few sports and just growing up you know high school and whatnot but then eventually gravitated towards football that was just my favorite and you know thankfully had enough um, skill and talent and hard work and whatnot to to play at the college level and really loved it enjoyed it um, but I was fortunate to that I didn't sustain a lot of injuries then. I had a few ankle sprains that um, one of them reared their head last year with some some PTT inflammation that Mm -hmm. my- uh, Yeah, I remember. Yeah, I told you about that. My partner looked at that for me. And it was funny because I found some surprises on my x-ray. I thought, holy cow, what happened there? But, um, you know, I had high Which could lead us but... down a whole rabbit hole of <laughs> that's a whole other what thing, you find right. on imaging and does it, does it no, necessarily. No, that's, that's, that that's actually a great, a, a great topic. I don't know how much you guys have talked um, about that stuff. Yeah, we, um, we a lot. <laughs> a lot. Yeah. yeah. We actually, um, yeah, go ahead, Alyssa. I, I was going to say, I really love how passionate you are about function and yeah. the emphasis on function. And I guess it doesn't yeah. surprise me that you're so active and you participate in a very function-oriented activity outside of your professional uh, you know, day-to-day work. And so what we also know about you is that you are, you're a barbell athlete. And I think that's really cool that you're doing what you do and you're a barbell athlete. And we really want to get your perspective on where barbell training fits into to orthopedics and all of that. So can you tell us how long you've been barbell training and 
what your philosophies are about barbell training and injuries and are your views about heavy lifting any different than, than the other surgeons or orthopedic surgeons that you practice with? Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, I mean, my, um, I was thinking back on this and I think I'd probably started working out with weights, maybe around the age of 14, give or take somewhere in there. And for me, it was the start and the, 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 why I did it, I guess is, is was mostly for sports. It was because I knew I liked football, wanted to play and I knew I had to get stronger. Some of it was originally also for just injury prevention. I mean, when I was, Oh, when I was 15 years old, I probably, um, I had never played organized football before. I mean, we always used to just play in the backyard. We used to you know, play tackle and whatnot, but I got involved first uh, organized sport in high, uh, football in high school, I should say. And that sport more than any, I mean, maybe wrestling, I never did wrestling, but I think you need training just to, for injury prevention. I remember I got a couple of what you call stingers, which are basically brachial plexus stretch injuries when I was um, a freshman in high school. And I remember thinking, I got to build my neck up a little bit here because um, just to prevent injury, you know, I mean, you're whatever, a skinny 150 pound kid and, um, you know, you're hitting and tackling and whatnot. And so I know that probably had some uh, sway in terms of, of keeping me on the field. So it was always for me sort of that dual aspect of injury prevention and performance. You had to get stronger just to keep up and to play at your best. And that's what got me into it. And then I found that I really enjoyed it. Um, like through high school, it was just sort of became a thing that we didn't get to do a lot of training in season, but as time went on, you know, I was doing it in the summers and then just made it a continual thing. And then when we were in college, we did it year round. So we were doing it even in season, we, we would do say a two day a week thing. And it was intense. It was tough to keep up, you know, with all the other things, but you realize that you then maintain your strength through the season, as opposed to sort of starting from square one. Um, so it always had that dual um, purpose. And I found that I really liked it. There's something very tangible about getting in the weight room where you literally can see your progress. You, um, what I love about and what I got involved with you guys was the emphasis on the specific lifts because they're so, they're, they're compound. They get everything, you get all of the muscle groups involved. I've never been a fan of these isolation where you're, you know, we're going to do one muscle at a time. That's not how your body works in athletics. And that's not how it works like in the real world either. So, um, so yeah, it continued for me. So to say that I've been doing it for whatever, 30 years now, I'm 47 years old. So um, 30 years, I guess I've been training in some form or another. It did get a bit derailed with time. Um, I, I, I loved, I always loved doing it, but then as time went on, I, again, I didn't have a lot of injuries when I was playing. But then as time went on, I developed this hip issue, which we'll talk about maybe a little later. Um, you asked a question about how do my perspectives differ maybe from my partners. I can't say I've pulled all my partners and, and know exactly what they think about the lifting or heavy lifting. I can say that I know some people will, will prescribe to people and say, don't do this and don't do that. Like, for instance, I was told not to squat, for instance, after, um, you know, getting the hip and whatnot. Um, and we can talk, I'm sure it's probably controversial, but I've actually found that as I've gone on and, you know, Rory has been phenomenal in helping me, like literally when I first started to say, okay, I can probably squat halfway. <laughs> and that was just a matter of, cause I had so much probably tissue contracture and weakness and whatever, but my symptoms and feeling of balance and feeling of strength have gotten better and better as I've continued to get lower and lower. So that to me has just proven that there's something to that, that to, to get stronger through a full range of motion. And it's helped me counsel patients. I'm not necessarily telling all of them, oh, go, you know, lift, uh, you know, tons and tons of weight. But what I'm it, just this knowledge of that sometimes pain is a function of weakness, not something structurally wrong. And, and that hit home with me when I saw the actual pictures inside my hip, because I had the recent surgery I had three years ago was a hip scope. There was the, the cartilage was predominantly good. Like everything looked, you know, pretty darn good, except for maybe a little minor little spot somewhere. That told me that whatever pain I might be having currently after surgery probably was due to something else. You know, it was due to like muscle or something else. And it really hit home to me that there are lots of things that we can't see per se, but specifically muscle, I would say, because we see muscles at MRIs, but we don't 
we're often not using that for diagnosis unless mm -hmm. it's some rare thing like a tumor or something like that. Mm -hmm. And that your body often has this one signal, pain. Like it's like, if you're okay, if you're not strong enough, if you're not flexible enough, whatever, it'll often give you the signal of pain. And then it's up to you often to figure it out. But we often do a bad job. I don't want to say as orthopedic surgeons, I want to say more as just human beings do a bad job of misinterpreting what the pain actually is. Um, so yeah, I don't know exactly what all my other partners do. I know some will just say, yeah, don't do that. You know, and, and I hear a lot of people, I mean, I'm getting older and one of the things I want to do is just, again, stay functional for as long as humanly possible. But I hear a ton of people who will say, yeah, I don't do that anymore. I don't want to, I don't want to do that anymore. All I do is machines and, you know, or all I do is just light weights and stick to this. And you say, well, you know, if there's, first of all, there's no like prescription of, beyond some weight or beyond some age, you just shouldn't do X. I mean, what I've really enjoyed about the programming that we've done is the focus on perfecting a few movements. You know, like I know that I'll feel better when the form is better, or I know that I will then improve my performance when the form is better. And so it's not like, well, okay, so I'm 70 years old. Like I, it, what to say, I shouldn't want to just still have a nice form on a particular movement, right? I mean, it's like, nope, stop and go hit the Nautilus machine. Like, yeah, all of a sudden right. it becomes dangerous, right? That's what right. Like all of a sudden <laughs> it, becomes, like, no, it becomes less dangerous if you can control it. You know what I mean? And maybe it's the load. So anyway, I've, I've taken some of the principles though from this whole journey and I don't, I wish I had a little better format where I could incorporate some of it because I think a lot of people are just starting from such a poor baseline to start with mm -hmm. that they're starting from such a decondition. I mean, if you look at just in general, our population, we probably start with, you know, so many people just the last time they were doing anything athletic may have been high school gym class, you know, mm -hmm. and, and then there's, there is a little more knowledge out there. There's more emphasis and, and there's definitely people who value their health and whatnot, but there's, there's a whole other segment of the population that just never does anything. And so you can make such huge strides in just helping those people go from here to here. So I try not to overgeneralize my own journey because it is mine. And I don't want to, you know, you got to be careful about um, overgeneralizing to my own patient population. But I think it certainly has informed some things. It certainly informed. I, I really like how I think you taught me this, Rory, is you talk about, or maybe it came from some of the books or you borrowed it. I can't remember exactly where it came from. but when you talk about um, lifting as a prescription and you say, well, there's, there's the right medicine, you know, the, so it's the right movement and then there's the right dose. Mm -hmm. So I actually have stolen that and I use that in the clinic a little bit. I'll tell people, you know, there's the right treatment and then there's the right dose, there's the right exercise and there's the right dose of it. Cause some people come in and they'll be on, they'll be somewhere on the journey, you know, they'll be somewhere on recovery from say a rotator cuff repair or shoulder replacement or something of that nature. And they'll say, well, I'm still hurting with such and such. And I tell them, you know, so for instance, this is my day every day. This is morning. I had clinic all morning, you know, and I'll, I'll have a person who will be, let's say, I don't know, three months, four months after a, a rotator cuff repair, shoulder replacement. And they'll say, Hey, I'm great up to here. I'm doing great in here. No pain, no nothing. I said, but geez, up in here, still a little sore. And you know, we'll feel around and examine and make sure there's nothing grossly wrong, like the cuss intact and all that kind of stuff. And then we'll, so well, where were you when you started it? Oh, I can barely go to here. Okay, so you were like that for Wait, how hold on. Can you can you back up one second? Because when you went sure. like that, your audio went like all over the place. Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry. It's okay. I talk in my hands a little bit too much. Sorry. Um, <laughs> but anyway, um, so I I um. So if I have a patient who's then say lifting, or, or we'll we'll go back and say, well, where were you when we first started the journey? I say, well, I could barely lift up to here, or I'll go back to the the record. I'll pull it up and I'll say, well, it looks like you can only get up to like 90 degrees when we first started, you know? So what I'll tell them is, look, imagine that you did not use these muscles from here to here. So there's going to be some atrophy, loss of use in that range, and they're going to be weak. That weakness often will be translated to your brain as a pain signal. So it'll tell you, whoa, hold on a minute, buddy. Don't go doing that. But as long as we're doing it in a progressive manner, kind of in a slow process, mm -hmm. then just think of it as a as a pathway to, you know, regaining that. And that, it, to me, it's been it's been confirmed in my own journey. I've I've um, 
I've seen that firsthand, which has been inspiring to me because sometimes doctors will say, well, there's nothing wrong with you. You know, they'll say, well, everything looks good. You look at the x-ray, the x-ray looks good. It's like, well, there's that element that we don't see, you know, we, and it's hard to see muscle. You don't, you don't pick that up on imaging. You pick that up in the exam room and mm -hmm. in their stories. So anyway, hopefully that answered your question somewhat and maybe gave more food for thought. Alyssa looks like she has a question, but I also have a question. Sure, sure. Um, so my question for you is how does you mentioned about like how do we like when did like we say that this load is just too heavy for people to lift you know like yeah. oftentimes we'll have patients come to us after surgery and their their doctor will have told them that they can't lift anything more than five pounds or they just never again can lift more than 25 pounds or a gallon right. or something like that um where does that come from and when you're talking so much about functionality and a doctor who's telling someone that they can't lift more than five pounds for the next six months, but like, what about a grocery bag, you know, right. or their kid who's two years old and has to get on the changing table or something like that, or be put into their crib. So how, how do we help um, patients kind of, or clients reconcile this recommendation? And is that a real long-term recommendation that, because sometimes people feel or in their impression when they come to us is that that's never going to, they're never going to be allowed to lift more than that. And some doctors even say, well, you can't bench press again, or you're never going to be able to squat right. again, or you can't do that for the next nine months. Um, right. So what is that? Where does that come from? It's so it's probably multifactorial and it probably a lot of it depends on particular patient and the particular surgery and the particular problem. So I guess I'll just sort of say in general, number one, um, there are some recommendations that are strictly based on tissue healing. All right. So if you have, so I do, I'll just use my examples because I know it the best. I do a lot of rotator cuff surgeries, probably the number one thing I do. I do um, a lot of shoulder replacement surgery. So in those surgeries, we know that tendon healing takes on the order of three months plus. Okay. So we don't, a, a general rule of thumb is that we don't load the tendons too much until at least three months, just because you're protecting it. Because if you have a re-tear of that, that's a real problem. That's a lot harder to fix than someone who's got scarring. So that's number one. So that's just very much a basic science kind of concept. Now, after that, then the, I think it gets more difficult to answer, more nebulous, because um, there's some of it that may be driven by work restrictions where they you know people are saying well, okay well what is a reasonable limit and sometimes you just find that out based on what someone can do i mean i i tell a lot of people if, if we're beyond sort of this hazardous zone where you might re-tear a tendon let's say or where you've healed a bone and you're beyond that then what's driving it it's, a lot of it is self-directed how much can you do as the person where did you start at baseline you know where were you were you conditioned at all to start with or were you not admittedly with let's say joint replacements like shoulder replacements you could talk to the people at the mayo clinic we just did a webinar on this like um they will some of the people there will arbitrarily say okay if you have a shoulder replacement don't lift more than 25 pounds in that arm they'll admit that that's somewhat arbitrary now why well you're worried about components eventually loosening now the shoulder is a little different than the hip and the knee the hip and the knee are a little we've got better longevity with the hip and the knee, to be honest with you. And the shoulder, we're hoping that our new implants are better. So they just put an arbitrary limit because they say, well, it seems reasonable, you know, or that might be one where they say, oh, don't bench press because that's something that you can, you know, you might get too much shear force on a glenoid component, but that's a very specific example. If you're speaking in generalities where you just have somebody who has some tendonitis in their shoulder and they say never bench press, I think a lot of that is just, they pro probably heard it somewhere, sounded good, but I don't know that there's a ton of data to support it. Um, so I, I can I wanna, tell you that- I want to oh, challenge this topic of the shoulder replacement and the 25 pounds and the hardware and all this kind of stuff, and even the rotator cuff repairs and all that stuff. So when you think of a bench press as an orthopedic surgeon, what does the load look like to you? Uh, I'm not sure what you mean. What does the load so, look like? So like, let's say um, 
a person who's been benching for a couple of years comes in and they're like, yeah, my best bench press is like 275. Yeah. And you tell someone, well, no, they can't bench press, right? Now, in the rehab process, we talk about progressive overload. So in the way that we approach rehab for, let's say, a rotator cuff repair, a pec tear, or whatnot, is as soon as they're cleared for active range of motion with mild resistance or whatever, we will use a very light implement to start progressively overloading the movement very slowly. So mm -hmm. that during that tendon or bone healing or muscle healing process, maybe it's a, a 10 pound load and then the next session it's an 11 pound load and then a 12 pound load over time through that three month period in, res in, in line with the tissue healing. And we know that overload has um, allows the tissues and the, the bone to align the, the connective tissue properties to align better than without loading it through, through mm -hmm. the range of motion. So as an orthopedic surgeon, do you, does that concept feel better to you than like, no, you can't like, you can't be bench pressing. Cause like we feel that sometimes when people come to us and their doctor's like, no, I can't bench press until six months. They're thinking of like 275. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, yeah. I, totally I started get that. someone and, with and a again, broomstick. That's, yeah, like yeah. No, I, I totally. <laughs> no, no, I totally understand. And and again, my journey has sort of informed me on that even more because when we started back, it was you know using the bar and using very lightweight with different things. And so I agree with you 100. percent I mean, in terms of the dose is the the load is the dose. Right. You know, so it's, here's the medicine and then what's the right dose and the right, right dose is going to be different for each person. So you're right. It, you don't want to overgeneralize and vilify the movement um, just because it can be done wrong at the wrong dose. It would be like saying, get rid of aspirin. It's terrible. Well, at a certain dose, it's terrible. Right. I mean, at a certain dose, water <laughs> is terrible. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. you, so no, I agree. And And so oftentimes I think you're right. What you're saying is that the movement we conflate an overdose of the movement or a poorly administered movement with the movement itself. And so the word bench press then gets vilified as opposed to the, you know, the load. breaking it down into yeah. what was wrong about it, you know, because again, right, we, right. and that's why this is where videoing has gotten really big for me personally, um, where I never videoed anything before I started working with you. And in the beginning, I was like, oh, this is kind of pain. I just, have... and then it gets real easy. And, and I, um, I even recently, I, I haven't, you know, I've I posted a little less regularly, at least once a month or so on, on our little um, thing there, the little, um, the, the group, there, the Facebook yeah. group, but partly because I, I, I check it myself. And I now, after looking at it for three years, know mm -hmm. where I am and go, mm -hmm. oh, that's a little off, but that's been huge. Like that's been instrumental for me. I wish I had that as a kid, you know, in sports and whatever, like we used to watch tape when we were um, in college for football, but this is just like that. This is, you know, having the feedback and, and looking at it, but that to me is where the constant emphasis on form too, you know, the, these movements aren't, they, they do, they take some knowledge. I mean, they definitely take some knowledge to, to do correctly. So yeah, incorrect bench press is not the same as, all bench presses or, you know, so we got to be careful about conflating the two, I guess is yeah. what I'm saying. I have a follow-up question. Sure, sure. So I think that kind of what we're saying is that in a situation where say somebody comes to us, they're working through a post-op rehab and we start them with benching a broomstick and progressing very slowly, that is probably okay. But I feel like these restrictions more so apply to the gym bro who isn't guided, who might go back, you know, who is trying to get back into the gym to make sure that he can still bench as much as he could before. Yeah. Or she, I like, or I she. I feel like we, we have had this <laughs> conversation because I asked you one time when we were doing a Zoom call, I asked you like, 
where do these restrictions on pec repairs come from? You know, like I've been benching with this guy, you know, with the 15 pound barbell since like four weeks post-op and got him back up to that 275 by the six month mark, you know, before the six month mark that the doctor said that he could never do again, you know? And I think that you mentioned that it's because you don't know what that person is doing. (laughs) Well, no, here's the deal. So we just had a, we had a conference a couple of weeks ago and, in fact, this is one of these cases of a pec rupture. And what you know about, there's a psychology to who you're treating. You know this, everybody's different. You know that if someone is coming in as a power lifter, a weightlifter, a bodybuilder, anyone, regardless of what you tell them, they're going to go back and do what they want to do. And so some of it, you're right. You're playing a little bit of, you, you have to say, look, here's where we're capping you because they're often going to go beyond it. And, and I get patients all the time. I mean, I get people, the other thing is the unknown. Like you're not near them. You don't know what their environment is. I have people who will, regardless of what you tell them, oh no, I'll be good. Yeah, I promise. I'll do this. I'll do that. We'll get themselves into risky situations. It's the situations that you can't predict. I, I've had people do all kinds of crazy things. I had a, a gentleman once who, he wasn't ready to play golf, tore his rotator cuff. Instead of playing golf, he went to the golf course and it was very wet on the golf course and he slipped and he fell and he tore his rotator cuff again, slipping and falling. How do we control for those things? We can't. So sometimes if you say, oh, these doctors say you can't do anything. Well, we're just trying to control for everything because there are certain problems that are, I don't want to say unfixable, but almost unfixable or much more of a failure, much more of a problem if you get one complication than another. And a tendon failure is one of them because mm-hmm. that's hard to fix as opposed to say scar tissue. I can fix scar tissue a lot easier than I can fix a tendon failure. So it may that may drive it to some degree. I'll be totally honest with you. But again, we're dealing with the big bad world out here with people who lie to your face about things and, you know. <laughs> so. so I I know Alyssa has a question, but I feel like this is like, right there with this what we're saying how does Hold your question Alyssa <laughs> I know it might, it might be the same question it might be the same question <laughs> as so we have a lot of um physical therapists physical therapy students chiropractors chiropractic students who listen to this podcast so for the physical therapist or chiropractor who does the rehab the optimal way like we do and and the has the power lifter or the bodybuilder or the crossfit athlete or weightlifter coming to them and their doctor put restrictions on them, like you're mentioning, because they are trying to control for worst case scenarios. What is the best way for the physical therapist to, one, connect with the surgeon? Because I feel like sometimes it's very hard to get in touch with the surgeon. And how do we or how do we approach a surgeon to say like, Hey boss, I know, or not even boss. Cause like we're the boss in the physical therapy department. You're the boss in the surgeon surgery department. But how do we say like, Hey, Hey doc, like, you know, here's what my plan is. I just want to make sure you're okay with it, you know, versus, yeah. um, does that make, how, how, what's the best way for someone to approach you about that? Yeah, I, I think reaching out is fine. I know, you know, we're all busy, so you're right. Sometimes it is tough to connect. But if I get a physical therapist who reaches out directly, I always call back. I mean, I, and I don't know whether, whether that's just me. I don't know. But typically, if they reach out and say, oh, you know, um, such and such physical therapist just wants to talk to you about Mr. So-and-so, and can you give him a call? And if you, as long as you give me a reasonable time where I can reach you, mm-hmm. then to me, that says that you're you're on top of things and that you care. And I am wide open to developing relationships. So it, it starts with a relationship and it may not be the one patient, but if you say, hey doc, you know, I've had three or four of your patients over the years. I love working with your patients. Um, they, they, you seem to do a wonderful job and they do, they seem to do real well. It's been an absolute pleasure. I want to keep doing this. Um, you know, can we sit down and talk sometime or I want to talk to you about specifically about Mrs. So-and-so, but can we sit down and talk sometime? I think we do things a little you know, I want to give you a little bit of our philosophy, something like that. I have, have reached out to therapists myself and partly because patients often ask me, where should I go? Now, some, there's a couple different ways of, of answering that. One is if you have a specific problem and you know that there are specific therapists who do well with that, okay, boom. Two is, well, where is it convenient? You know what I mean? Some people, it's a basic problem that there's a lot of, and I trust that the therapists are going to be good. 
go where it's convenient, go where it's close, you know? Um, other times it's people that I know well, and I, you know? Um, but I am not averse at all to making relationships. And it's about, yeah, it may not be one conversation. It may be more than one conversation. And eventually you're going to key in, even if they're not going, oh yeah, this is awesome. They're eventually gonna know what you do differently. And they'll also get feedback from the patient. They'll hear, if they're raving about you and saying, you know what, these guys paid attention to me because from what I know of what you guys do, you probably have to be a little more hands-on because you are teaching them very specific things. You're getting in the weeds a little more than here's your five exercises, go in the corner and I'll see you. That's what patients don't like. They like to know that they're getting, mm -hmm. and if they feel themselves getting stronger than they've been, then mm -hmm. they'll go, well, I did, they did a really good job. I really like them. If the surgeon starts hearing, because I, I will hear that, I'll hear from certain uh, patients that'll say, oh, I go to so-and-so and I love working with them. That says something. So it's kind of reciprocal. You'll probably have this where you'll see, hey, you know, that guy's uh, surgeries, they seem to do well and whatever. You'll, you'll have that, I'm sure. And it's, it's sort of thing. But again, it, it's basics. It's pick up the phone. I mean, I, I, again, if, if they're not answering your phone call, okay. I mean, you're not going to maybe convince them one way or the other, but, right. but just, yeah. I think we have to get back in medicine a little more to the high touch, you know, uh, emails, just there's so much email, just pick up the phone. And if, if they don't answer fine, but know that, you know, people are busy. Is there a specific time we can, we can talk I for like five minutes? I like being specific, you know, whenever Be we, specific. yeah, whenever we reach out to people to book meetings, we're always like, here are the times or what right. times are you available so that, you know, we put this in our calendar today, right? I mean, that's how yeah, exactly. Otherwise, it wouldn't have happened, you know. So. <laughs> um, Alyssa, did you have a question? I forgot. I, you know, was I that did. the exact I, question? Because you thought it might be the exact question. I lost. It wasn't the exact question, but yeah, I do think that there is, there can be a disconnect or some level of fear from physical therapists when it comes to veering away from the specific post-op protocol, and that conversation might be helpful, especially a physical therapist who's getting a lot of referrals from, mm -hmm. from surgeons and just wants to follow it to the T when maybe, you know, there might be some outliers who, especially somebody like a lifter who's getting back to, to training that well, would benefit I, even more. I love what you just said, Alyssa, follow it to a T. Um, cause Matthew and I had a conversation. I don't know if you remember this, Matthew, but I asked you how you come up, you know, Every surgeon has their own protocol that they send us. Uh, um, well, not every surgeon. Some people, some surgeons get like a standard protocol from like some hospital that put out a protocol for different sur surgeries or whatever. But I asked you once in a call, I, it, how did you come up? How how do surgeons come mm -hmm. up with their post-op protocols? Yeah, I remember that. Yeah, yeah. And, um, you know, because patients look at it and they say, well, this is the range of motion that I can go to. This is the amount of weight I can go to. These are the exercises I can do, especially if a surgeon is like very specific with what exercises mm -hmm. they put in a protocol. Um, and then physical therapists fall into the trap of, well, this is what the surgeon said we can do. This mm -hmm. is what we only, only what we can do. So right. where do you come up with that? And is it expected that the fit, especially because I think this is kind of where in the last like decade, physical therapy has gone from a master, a bachelor's to a master's to a doctorate, um, which gives us a little bit more clinical leeway in making those clinical decisions and being the, the, uh, the lead team member in the exercise prescription. Um, so where do these protocols come from? And what is ex what is actually from your perspective because i think yours is a little bit different what is actually expected of the physical therapist when they receive a protocol from a physician yeah so i think there's a couple of places where the the programs come from one is they're passed down so i remember thinking when i finished residency that nobody had sat me down and said okay here's what you got to do for therapy now you know here's what you do so i had to gather from all my sources and a lot of it was from the surgeons that i worked with then there's the Again, kind of going back to some basic biology. So there's tendon healing and bone healing. Those are going to follow certain time frames. And for me, that does inform some of my protocol. So like from the basics of how fast does bone heal, how fast does tendon heal, those are the protection parameters that I would put in. And for me, I'm 
relatively firm on just those initial protection parameters, but then a lot more flexible on you're going to be doing a lot deeper analysis of where they're weak. You might say, oh, well, they need more rhomboid and serratus and et cetera, et cetera. And I'm going to know the goals, but I don't, I don't do, I'll call it the Harvard method, not to crack on anybody at Harvard, but I, I once looked at a protocol from Harvard and they literally was like what you were describing where it was like eight pages for a rotator cuff, but it, they were super specific with everything. Do this and then do this and then there's a, mine's more, got to fit on one page. You know, it fits on one page and then here's the, I also want you to have some flexibility and leeway because it's probably no fun on your end. It's, it's not just about fun, but it's no fun on your end to just say, hey, I'm just following a recipe here, you know? Yeah. Is because there's there's no way there, there's many many ways to improve emotion and get stronger. I mean, there's a million exercises. So th- there's got to, there's going to be some where you want to work. And I've again grown to really appreciate more the idea of movement patterns as opposed to specific exercises. I and and again, this might get me in trouble, but not to uh, not to get in trouble with the bodybuilders. But the bodybuilders do a lot of isolation type stuff where they are overly reductionist. You've broken down such and such muscle group because you're working on the peak of your bicep or whatever. It's like, Oh, you hit the medial head and the short head and and you get, you get overly into this, you know, angles and everything. Um, I'm a little less reductionist in that sense and probably more holistic in terms of movements because what do you do in everyday life? You know, you're Mm -hmm. getting up out of a chair or you're climbing stairs or you're, you know, lifting up into a cabinet as opposed to I'm, you know, doing a tricep kickback. Like what motion? Who's doing that? You know what I mean? Like, no, I saw that's so, so funny. I had a client who was like, why don't I have sit-ups in my program? I said, well, when right. do you do like weight, like a, like a sit-up in your, right. when do you do that in your life? He's like, well, when I do sit-ups in my morning exercise routine, I'm like, right. well, like, Okay, so, and then he goes, oh, yeah, like, well, when I'm pushing a door open, I'm like, no, that's an isometric contraction of your core. Yeah. And, you know, and so he, I was like, you come up, aside from getting up out of bed in the morning. And that's probably you, not how there's is. Which you also <laughs> use your arms usually <laughs> to get up. Right, right, I was right. like, tell me in your life when you do that, and then we can put it in your program. But like, yeah, you and, know. And I think- to, to a large degree, there's been a big evolution in exercise science, like over the years, you know, since maybe I, you know, let's say last generation, there's been, there's been a big emphasis, I think, to where that's recognized more, the functional, you know, mm-hmm. the, how does the human body move as opposed to, and, and you probably argue that, you know, there's people who back to ancient times have known this, you know, some of these older, um, methodologies, yoga, et cetera, all these different things and body weight exercise. They just like, oh yeah, of course, we've been doing that from the get-go. So it's it's cyclical. I mean, things go in, in cycles and we rediscover and whatnot. Um, but yeah, back to your original point of where do these come from? I, I think, again, there's sort of the inherent biology of what is tendon healing and bone healing. And I'm obviously not going to push beyond when that fracture is solid, you know, for a load. Um, and then there's some where it's literally just passed down because it is so incredibly difficult to study some of these things when each person I, I liken a lot of what we do to and what you guys do to more custom made clothes as opposed to buying things off the rack i mean there's a certain amount of things you can do off the rack but each person might have a little bit different strength deficit or a little bit different range of motion deficit and you have to analyze those independently and it, and, and to make a one size fits all besides the again sort of the beyond which you can't you, you should protect um those types of parameters that's how some of these things um, that's why it's really difficult to create some either evidence-based or protocol therapy programs. I think you can have guidelines. And again, this is all my personal opinion too. I mean, there's maybe there'll probably be a million people who come up and say, look, I got 25 randomized controlled trials or whatever. Um, <laughs> it's honestly something we want to look at. I've been, we're in the midst of doing a survey. So if there's physical therapists out there, we'll send it. Maybe we could put a link or something. We started a study. We, we called it phase three of rehab, which is just this, where I looking at tendon repairs and, and shoulder replacements. And my kind of gut feeling is that therapists often send people home with a whole slew, maybe too many exercises when they're done with their therapy. Like what phase three would be, let's say you've gone through phase one of 
regaining passive motion, phase two, getting active motion, and phase three, I would call strengthening onward, okay? And moving out into the rest of your life. <clears throat> so we're, we, we're right in the middle of putting out this survey of, of surveying physical therapists. How many exercises do you use? What do you use? What do you emphasize? Because I'd love to do a study that shows, um, that looks at that phase and can you simplify it to some degree you know i'd love to do that we're kind of setting the groundwork for it so maybe we'll just stay in touch and let you guys know you guys seem to have a great outlet for it to, and people who are interested in this yeah so concept it's so, interesting because we we incorporate phase three right from the beginning yeah so when we talk about return to sport or yeah, beyond, yeah, yeah. that starts with us right from the beginning um, yeah. and, well, I know, probably have some stuff to learn from you guys then. That may have to be another episode, but you, I probably have a lot to learn from you guys. So. Yeah, no, we would love to talk about it. It's it's something that yeah. um, we're, we we talk about it a lot, um, and we, we'd love to actually – that would be a fun podcast episode to do where we kind of talk about what our rehab process looks like for, yeah. you know, a shoulder – you know, any type of shoulder surgery or whatnot. That would be a really cool episode to, to do. Yeah, we totally – or just, like, have a meeting offline first because I, I wouldn't mind – you know, these things are a constant evolution. I'm always looking to saying, okay, am I really as up to date as I need to be? Or mm -hmm. my, how, has my philosophy changed? But yeah, it'd be really great to, well, I think to see that, what are you guys that doing? You the know? standard physical outpatient physical therapy practice does separate it into um, yeah. the yeah. phase one, phase two, phase three. But there's this kind of like new wave of physical therapy, just like you were talking about how everything changes and evolves over time. You know, like you went, there's the reverse shoulder replacement is now a thing where it wasn't in the past. Um, you know, there, it changes all the time, you know, where when we, when I first graduated PT school is very manual based, you know, like every physical therapist was a manual <laughs> therapist. And, and then I, I got all the manual therapy certifications and then, you know, I don't use any of them anymore because I'm, <laughs> you know, like all exercise based, but um, no, that would be a fun, a fun conversation. So yeah. let's, let's dive in a little bit to talk about, I kind of want to just briefly talk about, you know, as a patient, so you had hip surgery uh, twice. So the first one was yeah. about 13 years ago, 10 years before. Yeah. Yep. 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 And then. Yeah. Had, so yeah, yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Oh, no, no. Yeah. I'll launch right in. Um, so yeah, the, the first one was 13 years ago. So basically, again, this was not an injury I had. This was just sort of a, uh, you know, some of your viewers and you guys, I'm sure know this deeply, uh, hip impingement. So it's something that the orthopedic community began talking a lot more about probably, I'd say, starting 20 years ago, give or take. It originally started with a guy named Reinhold Gans, who is a, a famous surgeon in Switzerland who was talking about this when no one else was. And, and he was doing these big open operations. And, and um, there were some early rumblings that this stuff works. And then there were people saying, well, that's a real big operation. And, you know, let's see if we can do this more minimally, basically. So um, I, you know, started having some symptoms later on. I mean, it had nothing to do with my football career. It was, I was like way out of football and medical school and all that kind of stuff. And, um, and I didn't, you know, uh, it didn't become a problem for me until much later. So I was, you know, probably my early thirties, give or take. And um but when I did, you know, you had asked, I, I think you, um, you had talked about, well, how did, how did it affect you? And it basically just, I was having difficulty, kind of the classic symptoms of difficulty sitting, um, kind of, you know, some groin pain and, and um, pain in the front of the hips sitting, um, and then pain with activities. So it'd be pain like any type of squatting type motions or other things. I eventually got to a point where even riding a bike, I'd be, I'd ride a bike, you know, 10, 15 minutes and say, I don't want to ride for three days again, because it would just be sore. It was this constant nagging, you know, pain where um, I wouldn't want to sit on an airplane or something like that. So I, I knew what I had. I had seen some people because I'm in the orthopedic world, so I knew who to talk to. Although I have to say this, the first time I got it diagnosed, it was still a little bit, it wasn't totally um, obvious, uh, but, but eventually kind of found my way to the right people. And I decided after my fellowship, which is in 09, I finished fellowship in 09. Okay, I'm getting this taken care of. I kind of, you know. It hurt enough, and I, I got to get this taken care of. I personally, again, I don't know how, how deeply your viewers have been in this, but I had a cam lesion, which is just some, you know, they're looking at this. It's almost like a a, a, um, a spectrum. Some people say it's 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 a little bit akin to a, a skiffy, which I never had that as a kid, but um, 
like a, a slight slip thing, so to speak. So that, that's mm -hmm. what you look at this cam as sort of a bump, a bump of bone, right? So the first surgery I had was with the surgeon that I know and, and trusted. And I was a little on the fence with whether I should get a scope versus this open procedure. And the open procedure, they, they changed it. So it was not this big open procedure, sort of a mini open procedure. I said, well, we've developed the techniques now where it's better and we figured out where we have to take the bone, blah, blah, blah. So I got it done. I had a lot of improvement. Um, you know, enough to where I was sitting more comfortably and just a lot more comfortable, but I still wasn't able to get back to doing a lot of things I like to do. Like I had significantly curtailed anything I was doing in the gym. Like I hadn't squatted in years. Like I don't remember the last time I had squatted and any of these other things like deadlifts or whatever. And I was kind of relegated to one little corner and just, I was busy. And so I didn't make a big thing out of it and say, but I still like to do those things if I could, you know? But I just looked at it and said, well, geez, I'm still having trouble riding a bike, you know? And then I started my career, you know, I'm, I had moved to Ohio and had kids, was busy. And I thought, well, I got improvement. You know, I'm not all the way better, but maybe I just had some arthritis. I didn't pursue it more. I thought, well, I probably have some arthritis and I'll just, you know, live with it. And when the time comes, maybe I need a hip replacement or whatever. So I just kept going, going, going. Well, I moved to Buffalo. It turned out to me, the turning point was moving here. Um, because I've got a partner here who I call a wizard with the scope. The guy um, is just, I, I saw some of the work he was doing. He'd been, he'd been learning for over 20 years. And I finally kept saying to myself, oh, and the other thing that was a turning point for me was I saw my mom go from having zero hip pain to within about two to three years, boom, ready for a hip replacement. I thought to myself, okay, I, I, this is what I do for a living. Like if I have <laughs> really got arthritis, how come it's not progressing? I was sort of, it hit a ceiling. And it wasn't getting better, but it wasn't getting worse. But I was still having some trouble sitting. It would still be real tight. Um, there were times where you know, like I couldn't ride the bike very long. I couldn't do a lot of, I couldn't run, couldn't do these athletic activities. I was like, is there something wrong? Is this? So I told my partner, I said, look, I, you got to come and you got to let me come into the office and just get checked out. I, said, I haven't had checked out in a long time. So I just want to get checked out and see. And he joked with me and said, you know, you might not like what you see. I was like, I know, I mean, there might be arthritis there, but if, if I if it is, I just need to know, you know. So I went in, got it checked out, and I literally was looking like this because I was like, look at the x-rays. <laughs> going Because my x-rays were up, but he wasn't in the room. I was going, I don't see any arthritis there. What? So I was blown away because I seriously, in my mind, I must have arthritis. Forget about it. Let's just power through and I'll wait till I'm old enough, you know. So he showed me the films and he said, I think we can help you. And I, I was like kind of blown away because I honestly had told myself a story that, um, you know, was, and I had tried, I, this is what I did too. You, you, I think you guys were wondering like, okay, well, what did you do? I made a new year's resolution that year. I said, okay, maybe I'm just not stretching enough. I'm just not diligent enough with whatever, you know, exercise. I'm going to just go at it. I'm going to be, I'm going to do it. I did that. I just didn't do anything. Like I tried every hip exercise. I went on the web, did everything I could. And it just wasn't going anywhere. So when he said he could help me, he showed me where there were some spots that were essentially missed. You know, that, hey, you had a really big bone lesion here. They needed to shave down more of this. Couldn't get to it unless you were doing it with the scope. We can help you. I said, sign me up. You know, sign me. So I still was half not sure whether it was going to work. I mean, I literally in my head was like, is he for real? Like, is this, I said, you know what? As long as I'm not going to be any worse, I know how skilled he was. I watched his surgeries. He's just, I saw his stuff. I'm like, he knows what he's doing. And I talked to everybody and said, okay, sign me up. So September of 19, and this was kind of cool because it was just before COVID hit and it kind of folds into everything. I got surgery and I could feel immediately that I was better. Like I sat the, the, Immediately after surgery, first of all, the surgery was easier to go through arthroscopically. So I, you know, I counsel patients on arthroscopic versus opens and whatever. And I do both depending on what it takes, but it was definitely easier. <laughs> uh, it was less painful. I didn't take any narcotics or anything like that, but it was definitely less painful. Um, and even that evolved because when I first got my first one, they weren't letting me put any weight down. And after the second one, I could put weight down on it pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. um, so. Um, Anyway, I hit a point where, again, I was still just wasn't sure what I was going to do. I went from saying, okay, I'd like to be athletic again. And I had lived for a long time with restrictions and not doing certain things, like not doing a lot of things in the gym, not riding my bike much as much as I want to, 
various other things, not running, not a big runner, but because of the pain I, or because the, because of the pain. Yeah. Because of the pain and um, not running because I felt way off kilter too. When I would run, it would just inflame tremendously mm-hmm. prior to the surgery. And so I said, how do I go from that? Like thinking literally, I can't do any of this to then somewhat of an athlete again. And that's where I ended up contacting you because I knew Grant and he said, I said, who can I talk to who can bridge the gap? Because I knew there was sort of the standard therapy. I did the standard therapy. I went three months of therapy. I did all the stuff, you know, you're doing your whatever, I don't know, all these different things, doing all these different things. But I still knew I was weak. I knew I was weak from a number of years of, especially the glute on the one side was very weak and still a little bit tight in the front. Although that was tremendously better. Like I knew I was like, this is different. This is, I've now got a baseline from which I can work. And Grant got me in touch with you. And I, I, the, the 2019 thing was, was uh, interesting because I was not even fully recovered from a surgery. I was probably six weeks in. And I told myself, if ever I can do this again, I'm going to, I'm going to put a gym in the basement, which I did. I went and bought a rack and I bought some old, like really thick mats. Like they were like gym clean out ones. And I built sort of a space on the floor and all this stuff. You see it on the, you know, when we log in there and I didn't even know I could do it at that point. I was just going on faith. I'm like, I'm just buying, I'm just doing it. I'm just going to set it up. I'm just going to do it. I don't even know whether I can do it. And then you met with me online. We've never met in person. We've never, and I got to give you a big hug when, when, and if we ever meet in person. <laughs> but um, I tell people, I tell my wife, I said, you know, my surgeon, who's, I'll give him a plug, Brian McGrath, who's phenomenal. And you are two of my favorite people because um, literally I continue to get better. And it's, um, that's proof to me that, that it's, it's not just about the surgery. It's about both, you know? So anyway, I, we met online and you said, okay, do this, do that. Like I said, I said, like, I don't know. You had me do a couple different things. I'm sitting different directions, snap a picture, do this, do this. And you, same thing. You said, no, I think, I think we can work with you. I think this is, you've got potential where again, I didn't even know whether I could do it myself. Like I literally thought, okay, if you say so, I don't, you know, I, I want to believe, but it's been so long that I just don't know. And it's just been consistency, you know, ever since. So yeah, I um, think, and, and going back to just that statement you just made and talk and, you know, just how you always, you keep saying everything, like we've been working together, I guess, for three years now, three years, because it was it was around maybe January or December around then of, of well, so let's just say it was January of 20 because it was just as covid just right. before covid hit because that's where it ties into the story because i bought the weight equipment before covid right before and i was so thankful <laughs> because i'm like no man i'm working out at home i don't know what you guys are talking about and everybody was like dude my gym's closed man i'm well, like and also people couldn't get equipment because there was like right and there was so I, had, I had, and everything <laughs> right i had gotten like gassed up enough where i'm like i'm set man i'm good and <laughs> and so yeah i'd still use the same little space that's all i need um and when we first met I remember telling you because this is something I tell everyone that it takes about one to two two and a half times as long as you've been experiencing yeah. your symptoms to yeah. feel like they're not there or affecting your function anymore and mm-hmm. you continued over these three years so now you're on monthly coaching so we only check in once a month right. together uh, every month when you send your monthly check-in you're like still progressing still feeling better yeah. every month and i yeah. remember even when you know you at some point were like you remembered that statement and you're like it's true you know yeah. it you you know it was it's super slow in the beginning because it it's just been there for so long you had two surgeries yeah. you weren't able to do things for years you know and these are you know when we're looking at chronic injuries because even though you had a surgery you were dealing with a chronic issue when we're looking at chronic issues there's the chronic accumulation of weakness loss of range of motion loss Mm -hmm. of function not doing those things and it's not like you have the surgery and just go back full throttle to those things we have to rebuild slowly regain that range of motion regain that strength regain the confidence and all that stuff and and that's what you're doing but interesting i want I wanted to ask you a question about um you had said 
you counsel because you know your first hip surgery was an open hip surgery and so for right. people who are listening um, especially the person who's thinking about having surgery or needs surgery and doesn't know what these terms are an open surgery is when the surgeon has to make an incision to go into the joint space or into the surgical site versus an arth- arthroscopic or a less invasive surgery is when there's tiny incisions and you insert probes into the the surgical site Um, Right. Yeah. And the analogy I like to use is like building a ship in a bottle. So you're doing mm -hmm. all the same stuff. Mm -hmm. It's just one's a little more, a little bigger incisions. And then, Mm -hmm. but, but, but there are surgeries out there where the arthroscopic, you just have better visualization. You can get to nooks and crannies that you can't Mm -hmm. get to Mm -hmm. otherwise. So. Yeah. So in terms of when you counsel someone, because one thing that we we've talked to a lot of our patients about is they, you know, the surgeries are kind of described as less intense or the the post op stuff is is they weren't expecting what they experience after in terms of how much loss of function they have for however long because of the type of surgery they had um you know how much help they're going to need how how pain how much pain they're going to have cuz a lot of people have more pain after surgery because of the surgery itself Mm-hmm. versus the injury that they're going in for the yeah, surgery yeah, yeah. for. Yeah. So as a surgeon who counsels patients going in, making the decision to have surgery or not, and from the from a patient perspective, how do you prepare someone for what to expect after surgery? Yeah, it's a tough question because there's different surgeries, there's different people, there's different life experiences, there's different ways people handle pain, there's different sort of psychosocial aspects to its support. Um, it's one of the most common questions I get, how painful will this be? And it's hard to predict. I get I get some patients who are, you know, I joke sometimes like little old ladies and you'll do a, a big, seemingly big shoulder replacement surgery and you'll see them the next day and like, oh, I feel fine. And then you get other people like, oh my God, this is awful. So I tell them number one, that I don't pretend to predict which person um, is going to have more pain than not. Number two, you know, that we're going to help them along the way one way or the other. And that typically, let's say a tissue repair type surgery or surgery in general, I guess, is there's probably a four week period where there's sort of the inflammation response and then that dies down to where then you may start to notice improvements. I mean, there's some where you notice right away, you know, where you just know it right away, but there's, there's going to be an inflammatory response after surgeries and some, you can't help it. I mean, I, we did some fracture surgeries yesterday and you can't help but use an open incision for that. And for a little while, you may have someone who has a fracture two weeks prior, they're going to start to feel a little better, you know, once the swelling starts going down, but then you're going to reignite that a little bit with a surgery. Um, so yeah, it's different for everybody. People handle it differently. There are modalities that work better for some people than others. Some people, I, I love icing it, you know, certainly it just numbs it. And there's controversy now whether ice mm-hmm. does anything. And, yeah. you know, they say, oh, don't ice anything because it'll slow down the metabolic rate of the healing, et cetera. But um, for me, just throwing an ice bag on just to kind of numb it down while yeah. I was up and around worked great. And, you know. Yeah, we're it, not it was, against using ice to help someone feel better in the short term, you know. Yeah, I especially think- if you can avoid narcotics, you know, yep. there's yep. such a huge emphasis now. I mean, the narcotics is swung, the pendulum swung the other direction where it, it used to be. People were using OxyContin and let's do these long acting narcotics, et cetera. And now it's swung the other direction where it's like narcotics are the, the devil. And, um, you know, we that's something that's evolving too. We've seen a big shift in patient perspectives. I mean, people have begun to realize that um, the side effects of them and they don't want to get hooked. So a lot of that's motivation. Mm-hmm. Um, in the same regard, you don't want people not moving at all because some people will say, I say, well, I'm not having any pain. And I'll go, geez, really? You're not moving? Well, as long as I don't move. Like, well, okay, <laughs> okay, there's got to be a balance here. You know, let's move just a little bit and get this going. <laughs> and we want you to be able to at least do this. And it's like, there's, there's balance between like no pain and no movement and some pain and some movement in that first couple of weeks. Um, but it's a fine line. It depends on the surgery. Uh, it, it's a hard question to answer, to be honest with you. And And, and really, I... I, I don't have one hard answer um, for it. Um, so, yeah, it's fun. You know, it's interesting when I get patients who have operated on twice where I've had someone with, say, two shoulders, you know, I did the replacement on one and did on the other or did a rotator cuff. And it'll be interesting. I'll always ask them, which one was easier? You know, which one was better? And 
and you'll get different answers. You're like, I don't know what you did this time, but this one was way easier. You know, and you're like, okay, I, I don't know what I did. Cause I probably because they just knew what to expect, you know, yeah, I don't and there's know. like less I don't fear, know. less yeah. anticipation. They know what to expect and they know it'll be okay. Cause I do think sometimes that's interesting you say that is because affected by, well, you know, am I going to be okay? That's huge. No, no, that's huge. You say that because I had a guy and I can't remember what case it was right off the top of my head, but I remember him distinctly saying that he was really apprehensive about surgery he had, and he really needed it. There was something, um, I think it was some, it was either an acute rotator cuff tear. There was something where it was, it was really, you know, if you don't do it, you're, you're going to have an issue with this. And, and he got through it. And then he said, I said, well, how was it? Oh, that was way easier than I thought. And I said, what do you think it was? And he said that exactly. He was super apprehensive because he thought it was going to be way worse. Um, and I can't say that's the case for everybody because I've had people who say the opposite. They say, well, the first one was really easy, but that second one was tougher. So I don't know. It's just a tough call. Um, but I can tell you, it, you know, it's multifactorial. But well, the, con the consistency, thing, I just wanted to hit on, uh, not to not to um, jump no, okay. topics there for a sec, but the consistency thing is huge. Um, there's been many points along the way in this whole journey where, you know, you've sort of guided me through, okay, well, you know, do this now and adjust to this and do this. And we had to use a lot of different modifications of the squat. The squat has still is a weak spot for me and has been, but is, I feel like I keep making little you do every month when you send your videos, I'm just like, I can't believe how good they look every, and, 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 the, you know, I like your, your case, so to speak, because, um, you are a prime example of, you're not a competitive athlete. You've right. had two hip surgeries. You lost a lot of strength, range of motion and activity level over the course of those 10 years between your but even before the first surgery you know yeah even before and, that right and barbell training was something that you wanted to get back to and all you wanted to do was lift the bar like lift with barbells and get stronger and and play with my kids and yeah. play with your kids and like ride your bike and go like ice right. i mean you went ice fishing you know <laughs> like yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and um we don't squat without a box. You're doing box squats because right. you're, you have such, and this is the, a very rare case. Um, we do most people, we can get to squat to depth, but you, and we tried with you, you know, you and I tried, but we did a box squat progression for a long time. We tried to take the box away, but due to the limitations in your hips from both the surgeries and the prolonged exposure to uh decrease strength and decrease range of motion you have to box squat and right now but yeah, i may progress out of that eventually. yeah exactly though. but for but for the past you know so for people who are like yeah. oh i, I want to squat to depth i have to squat to depth i need to do it now it has to happen sooner rather than later it doesn't you know you're squatting right. it's improved like every month there's like a millimeter of improvement right. and right. if it takes you six years to get to depth it takes you six years like you're not yeah. in a rush and for the yeah. non-competitive athlete who just wants to get stronger it doesn't have to be the ideal version of right. the lift it just has to be the closest version that we can get to that that's comfortable and allows you to keep training yeah and that's what's been amazing to me i'm still blown away um that I keep, I just, you know, keep making little tiny gains and I don't even mean gains in weight. The weight comes because what happens sometimes the weight is a bad proxy because sometimes the weight, like you hit a weight and if you're just focused on that, then you can be disappointed if you're not yep. shooting way beyond it. For me, I know better. Thankfully, some of this is just age and wisdom where I've been at this long enough to know not to worry too much about that. There's um, how it feels because there were times where I would hit a certain weight, but then I'm still like, well, oh, still a little sore in that one area um and and sore meaning like there were i would call them dead spots there were dead spots in areas i don't know whether it was scar tissue weakness whatever where i'd hit a spot and you almost feel like a vacuum like i don't feel any strength in that one little spot on the way down you know those are slowly going away and as they do i'm getting more balanced so obviously the right you know the one side was stronger than the other um, and then when they do, then little other things start to click into place, like little things like, you know, I'll say, Hey, I still feel like I got to get my hips back more. I can't do it because I feel weak in that one spot. And then all of a sudden 
that weakness starts to go away and you go, oh, I'm not feeling that little twinge in that one spot anymore. And anyway, to me, it's proven, like we use these rules of thumb because we've done studies on people with shoulder replacements and cuff repairs, blah, 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 where they'll keep getting better. We'll say up to 18 months, okay? Well, it's probably just because those are the people we've studied. It doesn't mean you can't continue to, you know, keep feeling stronger with some of these other things because I feel like I'm proof of it. You know, I mean, here I am three years. And if you told me, well, yeah, you could keep getting better after three years. Could you cite a study that says that? Probably not. But can you do it on an individual case? Yes, yes, you can. You know, if you're starting from a certain spot. So that to me has always given me hope. And I still... You know, I have bad weeks every so often. Like I was a little run down last week and, you know, give my confession. I missed a day on Sunday. But um, what what do you do then? Because I, I was I was like, oh, I was operating like crazy last week and whatever. I just got a little out of sorts. But you go in and you do a little bit, do a little bit of what you can, and then you pick it up next week. And if you aren't feeling it and it doesn't, you know, go up by what the program says, fine. You wait and then you just keep going along but i don't know i i i'm just thankful you know I and mean, i'm just thankful for the fact that um as long as you stick with it um it's continued to add to the quality of my life and i'm i'm just very thankful that's all yeah no i love it um i have a question so for sure. the athlete who is trying to make the decision to have surgery um, and they're worried about the process of getting back to barbell training. What recommendation as a surgeon and as a lifter um, who has not only gotten back to barbell training, but picked barbell training up after surgery, um, what would you recommend to them in terms of if they're kind of weighing the like, let me ride this out and wait and see, or let's have the surgery. What would you tell them? Yeah, again, I mean, each of these is tailored. We talk about this a lot. Like we have this discussion in my world, at least about shoulder instability, because there's a difference between, okay, what do you do with a first time dislocator, dislocation of your shoulder in season versus out of season? You know, can you ride out the season? So there's some of that plays into it. Um, it'll play what uh, how long a problem's been going on plays into it. Um, what the nature of the problem is, obviously. Um, you know, you're going to go, from a surgery's perspective, you're going to want to go to somebody who does a lot of these and has, I'd say, broad experience and has, mm -hmm. has helped people back through that process. It's not afraid to get people back to athletics. I've, again, I've been very thankful just in my mind, I had this idea of how do I bridge the gap? And you guys have filled that role for me. So I, I want to take this opportunity to thank you and to, to praise what you guys have done because it first takes the mentality of can it be done mm -hmm. and I, I again you guys have kind of pointed to this maybe you pointed this more on other episodes about there's a little shift in mentality so it's not um sacrilegious now this may, idea maybe but there still is uh, a concern about training barbell and lifting etc um but you have to find people with the mindset because you mm -hmm. obviously have testimony i'm sure from multiple clients and people who you've no we've done this we've gotten you through the process and there's ways of variations and there's timing and there's rep you know schedules and there's load modification and there's all these different techniques but the basic principles are the same if you read that blue book you know that uh they, they, you look at the mechanics and, and you, you talk about why do compound movements as opposed to some of these other types of things. I mean, like I look at CrossFit, like CrossFit probably in a lot of ways was a reaction against some of the maybe bodybuilding where bodybuilding, unfortunately, and again, not to crack them, any bodybuilders out there, but it, it set the world back. Maybe body, maybe it's because it was a platform for steroid use i don't know but it set the world back a, a big ways in terms of people thought well i'm gonna look like that guy if i do this and now i mean a lot of women wouldn't lift weights you guys are you guys are a, a testament to what can be done um you know when you just strength train but a lot of women would say well, i'm gonna look like you know mm -hmm. the incredible hulk 
<laughs> no, you, you, what we need to do is have more people building their bones strong enough so we're having less hip fractures when they're 70 and 80 years old. You know what I mean? Thank and that's you. not really what happened. <laughs> yeah. So CrossFit was a good reaction in some ways to that because they're like, oh, well, these guys are just trying to, you know, tweak individual muscles and whatever, and we're all about function. Great. But in the same regard, some of the things they were doing, some of the things they do do are extraordinarily technical, like a, like a snatch or a, a power clean are really, really super technical lifts. And if you're doing them once a month because you're changing up your routine every time, might not be the best idea. I'm not saying you can't do it, but you've got to be mindful of that. So it's nice. Again, I'm, I like the fundamentals. I mean, that's kind of my mindset all the time. And maybe that's why I've meshed with this. But the fundamentals of learn a few really basic things. The other thing is time. I mean, I don't have time to sit there and do three hour workouts. Mm -hmm. Like, I need to get the most bang for my buck. And to me, these compound movements do it. You know, you're doing chin ups, pull ups, you're doing squats, you're doing deadlifts, you're doing these things, and you're getting a good amount of work in using your whole body. And you're going back to them each time and trying to perfect the, the motion. So, um, you know, there's something foundational to that, I think. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, I don't know where else to go with it, but. Uh, no, I mean, I, I, we we love. I mean, just the fact that you you have the same viewpoints on CrossFit and and strength training, so that you don't fracture when you're seven, less fractures when you're seventy. I mean, we see it all the time, and you see it all the time as as an orthopedic surgeon who fixes the fractures and the PTs who rehab the fractures. A lot of that can be prevented if you are just stronger. And the same thing with CrossFit injuries. Um, you know, it's random. And yeah, I'm not against it. I'm not against CrossFit in general. It's a wonderful, you know, methodology to some degree of, of like you're doing a lot of different activities. And there's a combination of like interval training stuff, which is wonderful. Um, it's, it's more of this idea of you have to change it every single time. That's right. the, the and just, of and a technical, of a very technical movement so it's if just funny a... because the crossfit gym so like if you're a member of a crossfit gym those programs so in quotes um are random like they're random right even, even though they're planned they're it's like mayhem basically but the the right. gym programs are not the same as the crossfit athletes that you see they're on planned oh, yeah. progressed programs like well, they're actually right. practicing so, those so it's not the same thing there's a a very yeah. big difference between CrossFit competitors are yeah. on programs and CrossFit pe people who go to CrossFit aren't on programs. They're just doing the wad or whatever the thing is for the gym. Um, and that, that sets you up for a little bit more of a issue. Um, but we do. Yeah. And that's where you gotta be careful of, of, of taking the nugget of truth, so to speak, and then overdoing it potentially or underdoing it, depending on which perspective you're looking at, you know? Yeah. So. So we do need to wrap it up though. Um, but we do have a lot that we could potentially talk about in the future. So hopefully we do get you on here maybe to discuss some of those things that we talked about um, and maybe even get your brother on here. Cause we're actually currently at the time that we're recording this podcast, we're in our spine month right now. So that would be oh, fun. To, we are going to do the head and neck in a couple months. So maybe we can bring your brother on during that time, but we wanted to thank you for coming on here and discussing um, all of your perspectives as a surgeon and how your own experiences play into that and what your philosophies are. Um, and we hope to speak with you soon. And thank you so much again. We'll talk with you, with you soon, hopefully.